And we are live on air from eCampus Ontario Technology Enhanced Seminar and Showcase. We'll be speaking with Simon Bates and uh, David Porter. Uh, first, I'd like to have us introduce ourselves, all the virtual folks introduce themselves, and then we'll introduce our, our on-site guests. Just quickly, I'm Christina Hendricks. I'm from the University of British Columbia. I teach philosophy there. And uh, I am one of the virtually connecting volunteers. So I've got Julia first on my list. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Burke. I'm an instructional designer and consultant. I've uh, worked for a variety of different uh, colleges and I'm currently working for Ryerson University. Thanks, and Luke? Hey, Luke. Yes, uh, I, I'm a um, former uh, sociology professor, but uh, actually since a, a year and a half, I'm a president of First University. Welcome, and Rosemary. Um, my name is Rosemary Helmer, and I teach as an adjunct professor for a number of uh, colleges and universities, including uh, U of T, Ryerson, Guelph Humber, Centennial College, George Brown, and I'm in their business faculties. Thanks. And um, Tracy. Hi there. I'm Tracy Mullins, and I work for Alpha Plus. It's an organization uh, that works in Ontario with literacy and basic skills providers, um, and we do. Uh, uh, support around technology integration. Wonderful. So uh, yeah, let's go to our on-site folks. So David. Hi, I'm David Porter. I'm the CEO at eCampus Ontario. Hi, Luke. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Simon Bates. I'm Associate Provost for Teaching and Learning at UBC, colleague of Christina's, uh, and I teach in the Physics and Astronomy Department at UBC. And we've got one more person who's just joined us, Marcel Chuck. Marcel or Chuck, if you want to say hello. Well, I think it's not, not working. That's all right. So um, welcome, everybody. I'd like to just start off by asking um, David to give us a little bit of background on the theme this year for the TESS. And... Um, so how Simon Bates fits into that. So uh, TESS is the annual conference that eCampus Ontario hosts for uh, Ontario educators. Um, we usually have between 250 and 400 participants. So this year we scaled down slightly. Um, it's always uh, in the fall and it's a conference to kind of celebrate the work that Ontario educators are doing in the technology enabled learning space. And one of the things that we noted from uh, the National Survey on Online Learning yet last year, and again this year, it will be reported that one of the greatest barriers to having more faculty and instructors be involved in online and tech-enabled learning um, is a lack of training or uh, targeted training that really supports their needs. And we've done a little bit of background research in this area, and we found that it's not really necessarily about how to use the technologies that's the missing link, but really the digital fluency they have and the facility they have with uh, using technology in uh, sort of empowering ways, both for themselves and for students. And so Simon's framework, uh, the framework of, of the attributes of the 21st century educator appealed to us as a kind of schema around which we could build a professional learning program in Ontario. And we've been doing a design-based research study of that uh, implementation. And so we thought it would be useful to have Simon come and be our keynote and speak to the genesis of his thinking about the program and ways that it might actually play out in institutional settings. All right, Simon, can you give us a little bit of a, a rundown of your keynote since we yeah. were not not able to see it? Happy to. So um, David's provided a, a great introduction. Um, what I try to do is, is really talk a little bit about where the, the genesis of this idea came from. Of course, in, in terms of resources, it's been fantastically built out. There are now the, these rich modules for individual professional development uh, around the components of what I originally called the 21st century uh, attributes of attributes of a 21st century educator. Um, but then 
I also wanted to to acknowledge a couple of things that I've heard in in feedback when I've been talking about it. In particular, things that are missing from the model, uh, in terms of the affective components, and some of the conversations that I've had with people after the talk and also online as well. There's a couple of people saying yes. Thank you for saying that was missing. We'd identified that. And actually, I think there's work underway to try and look at some of those affective components as well. Um, and then also really try and frame it in terms of, given, given the way my role has changed uh, in between the time when, when this, this anatomy was first conceived and, and the position that I'm in now, think about ways that parts of the framework can support institutional priorities and activities. Uh, and so some of the examples that I uh, that I shared were around the paired teaching approach in the Faculty of Science that really supports in a very intensive yet natural way, supporting faculty members really become, you know, expert teachers for learning to really get a sense of what works for students and have an opportunity to put that into practice uh, in the classroom, but in a safe environment where they're paired with a more experienced uh, faculty member. I talked about experimentation and the crucial role that I think education focused faculty have to play in that area. Talked a little bit about the roles, uh, Christina, that you'll know well in terms of the educational leadership faculty. Uh, made a plea once again to get away from teaching only as the label for these faculty members because of the sort of deficit connotations. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the area or the component of technologist uh, supporting faculty to use technology fluently and in educationally appropriate ways. Uh, I talked about the success that we'd had setting up this, this sort of single front door for learning technology support, the LT Hub, uh, and also ways that we've worked to provision more agile support to faculty members. So the Student Learning Technology Rovers program that we've, uh, that we've built up and has really proved very, very popular, not just in terms of general, learning technology support, but as we've gone through this last 12 months where we've transitioned to uh, to a different LMS. So that's 35, 40 minutes in about 90 seconds. <laughs> well done. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll throw it out to anybody here who would like to ask a question or I can ask questions. I've muted you all, so if you want to ask something, you, you'll have to unmute. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any yet, but there might be more later. So I'm curious, um, one of the things that you were talking about, Simon, was the teaching focused track uh, in, at UBC. And I'm curious if, if you're talking to anybody else around there or David, if you know of any similar things in Ontario, I know there's one in Toronto, uh, University of Toronto, but I'm not sure about anywhere else. Yeah, there are very, very few of those uh, at our universities currently, and I think it's a, it's a growing um, opportunity. I think people are spotting it, and they're going to more and more professional events where they're hearing from uh, <clears throat> exemplars of those models, such as the University of British Columbia, where people are trying these uh, approaches uh, in ways that may not have been considered as yet here in Ontario. And so I think we, we often look west for inspiration, um, but we are also got a phenomenal, uh, just a concentration of creative individuals who are willing to, once they hear about a good idea and get support from an organization like ours, begin to move it out. We've had no problem attracting uh, cadres of uh, instructors and other professionals, staff and, uh, instructional developers, librarians, to take what we're calling the Ontario Extend program, extending and empowering your practice. Um, and we're uh, just really feeling that it is a latent need that people are beginning to see themselves. And they hear the conversations among colleagues and see the Twitter stream and begin to understand that there's something there that may actually also support and help them as well as kind of ring their chimes from the perspective of a colleague professional network they can be a part of. Yeah, I, I certainly learned, I caught up with some colleagues from UOIT who I visited a couple of years ago, and I think they now have uh, a 
they were telling me about some changes in the titles of their ranks. So they now have assistant professors of teaching and associate professors of teaching, not full professors of teaching, but senior professors of, uh, or professor senior teaching. Uh, forget what the, the actual wording is. So I think these roles are, are becoming uh, more common and more prevalent. I, one thing I want to say, it sort of echoes David's point, really. Um, these colleagues play a really important role, but they do not in any way hold the monopoly on, on innovation or influencing the, the, the practice of others. If you look at um, our institution at, at UBC, I think these, t these education focused faculty uh, comprise about 10% of the total faculty complement. Uh, and so, you know, we really have to engage a broad spectrum of faculty members, educational support professionals in this work and this conversation, because I don't think as important as, as any one group is, I don't think uh, they're going to get there uh, on their own. One of the other things we've been trying to um, promote as a part of the Ontario Extend program is to encourage faculty members to take some risk, particularly in the scholarly teaching areas and experimentation areas. And one of the um, <clears throat> tools that we provided with them with is a domain of their own on the internet. Uh, because we actually believe that uh, building confidence with a public professional presence is very important. And we want to help people build that out in ways that it works for them as a scholar and professional and gives them a place to be their scholarly outlet that might be beyond uh, simply uh, papers and, and other kinds of uh, research outputs. Uh, we want them to be uh, in the sort of op-ed field too, thinking about ideas and promoting those with colleagues and, and peers. I had a question. Um, you discussed the, the challenge with the, the training gap in terms of, of digital literacy, and uh, you spoke to um, the modules that you created, and I'm interested in the uh, materials that are already available for, for faculty. I work with a variety of faculty. Um, some have online experience, um, others are purely in uh, a face-to-face -face environment and now are, and then are transitioning to creating these online courses. So I was just wondering if you could speak to some of those resources that can give uh, faculty a better understanding of what online education is all about, what it can look like, um, how to improve their own uh, digital fluency. Thank you. Yeah, our, our approach has been to not impinge on the work that teaching and learning centers may already be doing. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, teaching and learning centers around the province of Ontario are working directly with faculty to, to help them design courses and build to a specific delivery environment and use the resources and tools available to them. And, and we read a very interesting study from Ireland in 2015 and another study from uh, JISC in the UK from 2015 each of which making the case that uh, that may not necessarily be the right first step and that digital fluency and a confidence to use the tools and to understand how they might play a role in the classroom or in an online teaching situation might be a better first step. And so one of the things that we've built out are six three-hour self-directed learning modules uh, that you can do by yourself uh, in a cohort-based approach or with a learning group uh, at your institution. We've open sourced all the materials, so they're all available under Creative Commons license. They're available in English and in French. Um, and we've actually made every component of the online uh, learning modules available right down to the uh, Word documents and scripts and image files in case you want to just download all the materials and roll your own. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Just, just and add, would you have a link at all or like a, a direction? Let's go to extend.ecampusontario.ca okay. and you'll find in the top menu bar a place where you can, it's not behind a login and you can find a place to download all the materials if you want to. Thank you. I, I maybe just wanted to add, um, I, I can't stress enough the importance of starting small, experimenting, having the opportunity to try things in a relatively 
low stakes environment. I think based on my conversations with a lot of faculty, um, whether it's designing a, a, a course with a very, very different pedagogical approach or learning design, whether it's moving a course that's traditionally been been taught in a three lectures a week face to face on campus into a heavily blended or fully online um, approach. That that kind of barrier, that step is, is very, very steep in real terms for many people. And I think the opportunity to experiment in when I look back, I realize this is what I've been doing incrementally for many, many years in my own courses. I've been changing things, sometimes small things, sometimes larger things, but it's this sort of spirit of, of experimentation. Of course, you hope things don't go wrong and, and you sort of contain them uh, so that the entire course doesn't go off the rails. But the opportunity for people to be able to experiment, to get ideas from other implementations, other disciplines, because many of these sorts of, sorts of challenges cut right across academic domains. So one of the interesting things that we've seen happen is that one of our universities, the University of Windsor, took everything that we had available online as a WordPress implementation and move it into their Blackboard environment uh, in a way that it, it dovetailed with two other teaching uh, sets of teaching modules that they used to um, orient and onboard new faculty to the institution. Another of our colleges is looking at it as a pre-qualifier for people who will be coming on board and teaching online courses. And the third group that is really interested are uh, part-time faculty um, who get very few actual opportunities to participate in formal professional development uh, on their campuses. And so being a part of a cohort with others who are full-time faculty and it's freely available and offered uh, multiple times a year is very appealing. So are there other questions from the group? Because I've got another one. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Rosemary. I have a question. As a business person, my natural inclination in any business is to understand the business model uh, how do we make this work so that it brings the open advantages to the student, to the faculty, without undermining the revenue generation aspects associated with tuition, associated with purchasing textbooks? Um, increasingly in the college system, as you probably learned from the strike last year in Ontario, a good well over 50 percent of our faculties are now not full-time with no guarantee they're a semester to semester contract uh, and so the people who are doing the course development are the full-time faculty members and when we're assigned a course or asked to teach a course we pick up whatever their format and approach is um, there is a bit of room for adaptation but not really a lot and so um, you know, I wonder how we make this work because it seems, at least in Ontario, the college system has decided that um, not creating full-time jobs is not the mandate anymore. It's it's running the operations at the lowest cost possible, which means not having full-time salaries and not having um, you know benefits. So, how do you mesh that model in with in universities? People have. Um, you know, full-time faculty where they can spend more time experimenting because they're paid to do that type of work in the college environment, and that's increasingly decreasing. Well, I think it's true in the in the university environment too. In fact, the recent study that was just published a couple of weeks ago shows that contract faculty make up a huge proportion of teaching uh, in universities and colleges in specific disciplines in particular. Our, our whole approach to this has really been about empowering individual educators and faculty members to be in control of technologies that may be, in fact, part of the teaching and learning responsibilities they have. Uh, our role, in particular, is not responsible for the business models, neither of the institutions nor of publishers. Uh, so we're doing the best we can with government-provided funding to make free professional learning uh, resources available to individuals to use to up their own expertise levels. And we think uh, help them advance within the organization if opportunities come up. 
Um, so I think our whole approach is about providing free and open access to resources for personal empowerment. All right, I have a, I have a question about um, paired teaching. Um, something that I'm really interested in uh, at EBC because I know the full faculty of science is doing paired teaching or thinking about it. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, Simon. Yeah, happy to. Um, so the basic idea is uh, it's an opportunity in which an experienced instructor uh, is paired with someone with less experience, could be a, a, a new hire junior instructor, could be someone who's sort of, uh, you know, not had the experience teaching, let's say, large interactive first year classes, second year classes, someone who's teaching online for the first time and has never taught uh, in that modality. So that's the sort of basic approach. Both faculty members um, really do teach the entire course together. It's not a case of, you know, one does the first six weeks, the other does the second six weeks. They are in all the classes together. They are in, um, they make all the decisions on the assessment strategies and all the course decisions together. Um, and, you know, the sort of key one of the key ingredients that, that we found in our implementation at UBC is they also have to make sure um, that they reserve time each week to get together and debrief what happened in the course that week. So that opportunity to just, you know, talk about how things went, to plan for uh, for the next, the, the, the upcoming week. Um, it was rolled out a few years ago at UBC. There was some research wrapped around it and evaluation to try and understand, well, just how effective is this? Uh, and colleagues from physics and earth sciences, uh, who were the two departments that participated in the pilot scheme, um, did some, some observation work in classes uh, and also some structured interviews to really look at what were experienced and novice faculty members in the pair actually doing in the classes uh, and the data that they found was broadly the same types of activities. There wasn't a, a sort of large disconnect between what was happening when the experienced instructor was was sort of front of house, if you like, compared to the the, the novice in, instructor when they, they took their term. Um, they also found that subsequently, after the paired teaching uh, episode ended, Typically, what happened is the novice instructor would keep that teaching assignment the following year. So if it was a large, you know, first year course, they would continue to teach a section the following year, but on their own. So the observations that they did the following year, they found a lot of those practices that they learned and got comfortable with in the first year uh, were actually carried over into the second year. And in many cases, actually transferred into other courses. So not the one that was the subject of the, uh, the paired teaching episode. And I think that was seen you know, reasonably consistently across multiple pairs. I think there were eight pairs within the, uh, within the evaluation. So it accounted for you know, the individual differences in dynamics between, uh, between a different pair. And I think actually it was the, the, that evaluation and research, it was presented to the Dean of Science. And as a result of that, the Dean committed to fund this for all new hires in the science faculty at UBC. Uh, which I don't know the exact numbers, but I would imagine it's, you know, could be as many as 10 or 15 hires a year, uh, depending on uh, academic recruitment. And I should just say that that's faculty across all ranks, not just teaching focus, uh, you know, education focus stream, but, but um, professoriate faculty as well. That's so, that's so cool. <laughs> so Tracy, I know you had a question as well. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, you mentioned uh, when you were giving your preamble something about, uh, when, in fact, just after you talked about the pair teaching and you said there was a single front door and that you had more agile support. Yeah. I was sort of interested in finding out more about that model of more mm -hmm. agile support. Um, so one of the challenges we were wrestling with in, in an institution the size of UBC, we have, I think, just over 5,000 faculty members. Uh, and the frustration that we were hearing when they had an issue that they would like support with and the sort of standard response was, well, put in a ticket and someone will get back to you as soon as they can. And, and they don't need an answer from a ticketing system in two days. They need someone to help there and then because the problem that they're having 
you know, it's a just in time thing. They've got a class coming up. There's an assessment deadline. They're trying to figure out how to do something before uh, uh, before a lecture. Uh, and so one of the ways we set out to try and uh, to try and um, address that was we created these roles called learning technology rovers, which were co-op appointments for students from particular faculties. So they were the, they were employed in faculties relevant to their, their own discipline. So, you know, within the science faculty, it would be science students or engineering students. And they were really just in time frontline support for learning technology issues, uh, including coming to a faculty member's office and, and, you know, not quite real time, but certainly a lot more agile and responsive than a, a ticketing system could be. Um, and, you know, we rolled this out, the Teaching and Learning Center provided the sort of community and the training and the support for these students because there was a sort of rolling body of students. Some did one co-op term, some did two co-op terms. Uh, and I have to say, it's been really, really successful. It started as a pilot in two faculties. Uh, I think we now have tech rovers across eight faculties at UBC across both of our campuses. Uh, and it really was the sort of cornerstone of support as we transitioned our, our learning management system in the last 12 months, uh, we employed specific tech rovers to support faculty in migrating courses and, and utilizing some of the additional functionality in, uh, in, in the new LMS. And, and sort of from the business perspective of it, um, it's relatively cheap and affordable to, uh, to be able to, uh, to scale because it, it's, it's co-op students. So we're just about out of time, but I wanted to let uh, maybe one more question happen if anyone has one. Looks like not. Uh, David or Simon, any parting words about the conference so far? Um, the conference is just warming up, just revving up. It's uh, a half day today and uh, a full day tomorrow. So uh, we expect it to be as popular as ever. And we're already thinking about what the theme will be for next year. Uh, and the hashtag is TESS18, T-E-S-S-18. -S -S and, and there is a very active Twitter community, both at the conference and beyond as well. I know sometimes you know, you go to these conferences and it's the same five people who are lonely <laughs> trying to tweet everything. Uh, this is really, really active and, and it is engaging people far beyond the 250 or so who are uh, here today, which is great. Yeah, I noticed that on the Twitter feed already. I've already gotten some links to interesting projects that are happening that I would not have known about without watching the Twitter feed. So anybody who's not attending the conference wishes they could be there, that's one way to do it. In addition, we also have um, two more virtually connecting sessions happening tomorrow. So uh, just check the virtuallyconnecting.org website. And I think with that, we will let our on-site guests go. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question. My question would have been too time consuming, I fear. So. <laughs> <laughs> and someone else asked, was this recorded to watch later? Yes. So anybody watching live, uh, it is also being recorded and that is accessible on the virtuallyconnecting.org website. All right, I'm gonna stop the broadcast. Thank you. Thanks.